my mission was to find out everything that happened to Kiki from the time he got picked up to the time he died. Kiki Camarena was picked up because he was about to uncover that U.S. intelligence officials was protecting the drug lords. There's layers and layers of this case. Hector Barreles is a former DEA supervisor and special agent with 30 years extensive experience in counterterrorism and narcotics enforcement. He is recognized as one of the most highest decorated drug enforcement agent in history of the Bureau. He was recognized by the U.S. Attorney General Ed Meese for his heroism. He received the Federal Bar Association Medal of Valor, the Federal Executive Board Chairman Special Award, and is credited for his handling in the solving of the kidnap, torture, and murder of undercover DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena by drug traffickers in Guadalajara, Mexico. This is the amazing story of Hector Barreles. Hector, thank you for coming on, brother. Thank you for having me. So let's get first into the foundation of your thing, Hector. Right now, there's a lot of memos. There's a lot of people trying to discredit you and try to say that your story, not so much is made up, but give us a little history of how long you were in the DEA. I was with the DEA 27 years. So why do you think that these people are trying to discredit you, Hector? The reason they're trying to discredit me is because with the FBI having maintained it as a corrupt agency, the CIA doesn't want to be basically uh, be seen as also as a very uh, dirty, corrupt agency, and neither does the DEA. And these government agencies to protect themselves, whenever a person comes out with the truth, they always try to say that you're lying or you're making it up. But right. guess what, folks? They have a very hard time uh, basically attacking me and saying that I'm lying because I have the evidence and I have the witnesses to prove that everything that I've said, every allegation that I've, that I've made about the, our government being complicit in uh, Kiki's murder and having been involved in inundating our country with drugs is all true. Now, they've also attempted to, uh, they attempted to shut your last narc from uh, Amazon down also, right? Well, they tried to put it down, but uh, we were able to uh, basically uh, prove to the Amazon people by vetting everything that, uh, that they, there would be no problem even if they sued us because everything that is alleged in the last narc, everything uh, can be proven in any court uh, of law. Nice. Okay, so now let's take it back to the beginning, Hector. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born and raised in uh, Tucson, Arizona, from uh, Mexican parents. Uh, I uh, attended and graduated from the University of Arizona with a degree in, uh, in business administration. And as a child, did you want to get in law enforcement or what did you want to be when you were a kid, Hector? Uh, when I wanted to be a kid, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Uh, my father wanted me to be an attorney. Uh, I enrolled at the University of Arizona in their uh, pre-law program. Uh, the Vietnam War came, 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 uh, came up and I was uh, inducted into the U.S. Army. I served two years in the, in the, in the, in the Army in and out of Vietnam. And uh, basically, once I got out of the Army, well, I decided that uh, I needed to get a job uh, right away because my dad had very injured himself on the job. So I didn't go right back to school with the GI Bill, but I, I looked for a job in the mines, uh, w which is where everybody works in Arizona. That, that's, a, that's a main place where people get good, good work. Right. And they weren't hiring. So I looked in the newspaper and I saw they were hiring policemen. So I applied and joined the South Tucson Police Department. So, so, so you were first a police officer. How many years did you do that for? Well, I was a, a city policeman and detective for three years. Later, I was a highway patrolman for two years, and that's when I came into the DEA at the age of 26. 26. Now, what led up to you becoming a DEA agent? Well, what really uh, convinced me to be a DEA agent was the fact that I had a brother that uh, became addicted to heroin, and oh. uh, I wanted to do something uh, to go after the people that, that addict, uh, uh, you know, young children in the barrio. My oh. God. My, my brother was only 13 years old oh, wow. when they hooked him on heroin. Oh, wow. And were you working as a narcotics when you were a, a, a police officer before you hit the DEA? No, you don't start in narcotics. Nobody does. Uh, 
I started as a, as a uh, regular uniform cop. Okay. You know, pushing red lights. Later, uh, as I uh, got more experience, I was, I was re recruited into the homicide division of, uh, of the investigation section of the police department, and I became a ho homicide detective. Wow. So then after the homicide detective, what led you to actually pull the trigger and become an agent? Well, that's, uh, well, I, after that, I went to work with the highway patrol because uh, I was, it was a higher paying job, a better job. And while I was a highway patrolman, they had a narcotics section, but I wasn't assigned to it. Uh, they didn't have any Hispanics in the, uh, in, the, in the drug unit at the time. So what they would do is they would borrow me from the uniform division and they would uh, use me undercover in the, in the, uh, drug unit of the state police. And that's how I started uh, becoming experienced in working undercover. One day I was writing tickets and the next day I was out there in plain clothes uh, buying dope from drug dealers. Now, now was, uh, when, how old were you, what, 20 something when you, were, uh, when you started doing the undercover work? I was about 25, 26. And uh, I was so good that uh, one time uh, we were working a case, the state police was working a case with the uh, uh, BNDD. It was uh, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs back then, before the DEA was even formed. Okay. And uh, I was able to arrest a major heroin dealer with a whole kilo of heroin, which was a major case. The, uh, the DEA took notice and they actually recruited me uh, from the state police to become a federal agent. But then I had a four-year degree and I qualified because to become a federal agent, uh, Back then and even now, you have to have at least a four-year uh, university degree. Okay, so now you're a DEA agent. Walk us through the process of how, how you worked your way up the rank of a DEA. Well, as a DEA agent, there's no really working up to the ranks. I mean, as soon as I graduated from the DEA Academy, they assigned me to uh, the border in Douglas, Arizona. And while there, not even two months, I was sent T.D. White to Colombia, South America. Oh, wow. Uh, and I worked in Colombia, in Medellin, in, 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 uh, in Cartagena, in Bogota, all those little cities, they're undercover. Now, do you think, uh, you, you, you obviously speak Spanish, correct? Absolutely. I speak Spanish like a Mexican, like a native. <laughs> That's right. So do you think that that helped you a lot more than the huetos, the regular, to say, DEA guys who didn't speak Spanish? Absolutely, the widows could not penetrate the cartels the way I could. When I was undercover in, Col in Colombia, I carried Mexican uh, passports and credentials from Mexico, and uh, I was posed as a Mexican uh, citizen. Never did they suspect that I was a U.S. drug enforcement agent. Now, when you say you were infiltrating the cartels, what exactly type of stuff were you doing in there, in Colombia? Well, I was, I was working with the Colombian F2 police who had informants who would introduce me to cartel members so that I could penetrate, find out their movements, uh, who they were selling to, where their labs were, uh, just everything, all kinds of intelligence that I could gather from them by hanging out with them, going out drinking, having a great time with these guys. <laughs> so you, you were out in the jungles, actually like in the movies out there, taking down or attempting to take down the cartels. That is correct. I have many times out in the jungles, a lot of times in the cities like Cali and, uh, you know, going in Bogota and the nightclubs, and, the, and you know, I had a great time. I mean, I was undercover, I was drinking, I was, we, we can't use drugs, but I was hanging out with the guys. Were, were you ever, af was there any moment in Colombia that you remember that you were afraid for your life? <laughs> I was afraid for my life all the time. Okay. Being afraid for your life is what keeps you, keeps you uh, alive. That's right. So how, <laughs> ma how, how many years were you working with the DEA before the famous Leyenda case came up with you? Actually, I had been working uh, with the DEA for about 12 years, uh, and I had become a supervisor by that time. And that's why I was brought out of Mexico uh, as a supervisor to supervise and run the, uh, the Leyenda uh, Task Force, which was delegated investigative responsibilities to look into the kidnap, torture, and murder of my friend and, and colleague DEA, uh, Agent Kiki Camarena. Right, so when you first got this case, what was your thoughts? You're thinking it's cartel based and, and you're just going to go after the cartel? Well, when I first got the case, I believe like everybody else that Kiki Camarena had been killed 
by uh, the drug lords of Guadalajara Cartel, Cano Quintero, Fonseca, right. Felix Gallardo, those guys, because they were mad um, as he had been blamed because he had discovered and destroyed the Buffalo Chihuahua fields, right. which was the largest marijuana cultivation fields in the history of drug enforcement. Jesus Christ, uh, uh, we destroyed 10,000 tons wow. at, at, at Buffalo, which was the biggest growing uh basically an enterprise that Caro Quintero and Fonseca had ever been involved in. Right. But um, I think there was also pictures of uh, Kiki Camarena at that scene, wasn't there? And the field? Yes. No, Camarena was never in the, in the, uh, in the Buffalo fields. The pictures that have taken, uh, were taken at Camarena was the, uh, the, the big seizure that he, that he, uh, he uh, was involved in, in the Fresnillo Zacatecas uh, ah. fields. Kiki was never, gee, that's a phallus. Yes. That's a government cover-up that Kiki was killed because of Buffalo. Kiki uh, did not participate in Buffalo. Yeah, because that's the reason they kind of gave, or gave us, I guess, the regular people, that it was because of that Buffalo raid. And, and you know what? That is exactly what I believed okay. when I took over the case. But when I took over the, it, 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 right after I took over the case, I talked to my friend, uh, Carlos Lugo, Char Charlie Lugo, okay. who uh, was a, uh, a fellow DEA supervisor. Actually, Carlos Lugo was the one that recruited me and brought me into the DEA. So when I first took over the murder case, I, I sat down with, uh, with, with, with Charlie over a beer in, in LA and I said, Charlie, and tell me about uh, Kiki's participation in Buffalo. And he said, bro, he said, uh, Hector, says, Kiki had nothing to do with Buffalo. And I said, what are you talking about? Didn't they kill him because of that? He said, uh, I was. I was carnal. It's up. Ah. He said, they're lying to you. That's a lie. Ah. I ran, you know, I ran the Buffalo Chihuahua raid. You know, um, I, I ran him with, with uh, Miguel Aldana, the, the guy from Interpol. You, you know him too. We ran the whole thing. Kiki was not even involved in it. Kiki did not participate. The only two DEA officers in Mexico that participated in Buffalo, as you know, was Hermosillo in Mexico City. The Guadalajara DEA office at which Kiki was assigned did not participate. And I said, so they're lying to me? They're lying to the world, buddy. He said, they're lying to everybody. I was, heads up, dude. He says, I was out. Something's up with this stuff. You better be careful. Now, after that meeting with that gentleman and you're driving home in the car, what are you thinking, Hector? Well, initially, I'm thinking, what, what, what's going on here? <clears throat> then I find out that, that I, was try I was trying to basically investigate Caro Quintero and I come to find out that Caro Quintero was flown out of Mexico in a CEA plane flown by a CEA pilot. <laughs> when, he, when he was flying to lead to Costa Rica, he was flown out by a CIA pilot by the name of Warner Lutz. And I'm thinking to myself, what is a CEA pilot doing assisting Caro Quintero flee when we're looking for him for killing Camarena? Excuse me, I'm gonna- Yeah, for sure. <laughs> take a little drink because I'm, I'm get, coughing. Get your money. Mm. Ah, thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. So that, that was very mysterious to me. Uh, you, I'm, I'm thinking, well, here I am, just starting on the case. My compadre, Charles Lugo, tells me he ran the, the Camarena. I mean, he ran the Buffalo raid. Camarena wasn't involved. I lie. And then I find out that the CIA flew Caro Quintero out of Mexico so he could flee from us. I'm very confused. Now, at this time, the, the Contra thing hadn't hit yet, right? as far as on the Not news. Yet. So explain to the people what was going on down there in Central America at the time with the CIA and the Contras. Well, I did not get educated until actually, I found out that there was a, there was a white Anglo-Saxon gentleman working for the Mexican DFS, which is a director of federal security. Now, now give, 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 me, give me a second, yeah. The DFS, what is the DFS in Mexico? The DFS is the Directorate of Federal Security, Dirección Federal de Seguridad, wow. which is Mexico CIA. <laughs> and what caught my attention there is what is an American Anglo doing working for Mexico's DFS? Now, I knew from the beginning that DFS agents had picked up Kiki Camarena and turned him over to the drug lords. So obviously, I'm focused on the, on the, on the DFS because I know they were involved. And then I find out that there's an American guy working for the DFS. Are you kidding me? Wow. So I reached out for the guy. I had already kidnapped my shine by the doctor that had ejected 
drugs to Camarena. Okay. And I got him on the phone and I said, uh, I said, uh, I need to talk to you. I said, uh, you're, you're working for the DFS? And he says, yes, I am. We're talking in English and I'm talking to this guy in Mexico on the phone. Right. And he says, uh, I don't want to talk to you. I said, listen, sir, you don't have a choice. I want to kidnap your ass. So you pay attention to me. Either you cooperate or I'm going to bring your ass up here anyway. Right. And you know, I have a reputation of being a very effective kidnapper. Of course, but then I've been all over the news that I kidnapped Dr. Machine. So he says, uh, listen, Hector, he says, uh, you don't know what you're getting into, dude. I said, well, I need you to tell me what I'm getting into. So he said, okay, I'll meet with you. But I couldn't go because I had a warrant for my arrest because I had already kidnapped the doctor. Why did you kidnap the doctor? I kidnapped the doctor because he was a doctor that was brought in when Kiki was, was uh, basically dying. They brought him in uh, basically to save him, but right. Carlos Quintero would not let him be saved. So they ended up uh, using the doctor to inject lidocaine into his heart to keep his heart beating, wow. which would bring him back to consciousness when he would go unconscious because of pain. See, when the body's in a lot of pain, it goes unconscious to protect itself. So when Camarena was going unconscious, this doctor was injecting lidocaine directly into his heart oh, wow. to bring him back to consciousness so they could keep interrogating him. Now, are these tactics that typical Mexican drug lords do to torture people? Uh, Mexican pe people uh, don't, usually don't torture people. Usually they just, well, they do. They do, but usually they just shoot you and kill you. They don't in interrogate you and tape you. So when I knew that Kiki had been interrogated and tape recorded, I figured that this, this was not a drug traffic or drug lord normal uh, assassination. Yeah, the drug lords will bring you in and they'll, they'll, they'll torture you. And uh, they usually tie you up and they're not very brave guys. In fact, they're a bunch of cowards. They're not, they're not big, big matones or big criminals. Uh, well, they're criminals, but they're not uh, courageous guys. They're a bunch of sissies. They only kill people when they're tied up or shooting behind the back. So how did you get the doctor over here to the States? The, I kidnapped the, him. How did you kidnap him? Did you go there and get a car and just pick him up? No, I got some people to, to basically surround his clinic and go in there and gump him, get him up, bring him up with a hair, put him in a plane, put him to wow. me, and I, 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 wow. I got him. I, I received him here in El Paso. You had a, a warrant in Mexico for the kidnapping, right? Well, of course, they issued a warrant for my arrest for, for kidnapping and also for violating Mexican sovereignty. Have you been back to Mexico since? No, I don't. Do you still have that warrant open over there? No, as a matter of fact, uh, the reason I'm speaking now and I, can, and I can bring the truth to the American public is because uh, in 2013, my warrant for kidnapping in Mexico expired. I'm no longer wanted in Mexico. But I'm sure if you go over there, you'd have a hit on your head for the cartels. What do you think? If I went over there, they'd probably only shoot me in the back. They, 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 they won't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, man to oh, man. They're afraid of me. <laughs> That's right. So now you're in here. You're finding out that Kiki was not part of the Buffalo raid. And you're finding out you got CIA operatives working with DFS. Walk me along the, the, your investigation. Well, well, what happened was once I was able to bring a CIA operative, make him a double agent, make him basically uh, turn against the CIA and start cooperating with me. He was the one that actually first told me that the CIA had actually uh, been complicit in interrogating Kiki. And I found out that one of the main interrogators had been a CIA, a well-known CIA operative, un cubano, a Cuban by the name of Ismael Felix Rodriguez, that he had been brought into uh, waterboard and interrogate Camarena as he uh, had a lot of experience uh, in waterboarding. He had been trained in the School of the Americas and also had uh, participated in a lot of torture uh, and interrogations in Vietnam. Excuse me. Now, these, there's actually recordings of the interrogations, right? They recorded it, yes, and I was able to see, hear some of the recordings. Now, how did you guys get a hold of those recordings? Actually, we uh, we got them from from the CIA. The CIA actually handed those over to you guys, and wh where do they say they got them? They say they got them from the Mexican government. Oh wow! Oh wow! So, you, so you're going in there now. 
you, you, you've got your, your witness. How many more witnesses from Mexico did you guys bring over to the States to corroborate the story you're saying? Well, actually, uh, during the trial, we put on over 100 witnesses, but the real witnesses that were at the scene of the crime that could walk us into the torture room, that could tell us what Kiki was asked, who asked him, how he was beaten, the, all the details surrounding his, his, his uh, kidnapping and torture interrogation. There was three of them that were there, and these guys had been bodyguards for the Guadalajara cartel. They were sicarios. And when you guys brought them over, I, I, I saw, I, well, I saw your, uh, your docuseries. They were actually separated and put in different rooms. They weren't in the same area where they can make up the story, right? To begin with, they were, they, they were brought up separately. They, they, did, they weren't brought up as a team or together. One was brought, came up first. Six months later, we got another one. And a year later, we got the third one. And, and now I have a fourth one. I just recruited another one. And all the stories are pretty much lining up the same, right? Absolutely, because what you do is you compartmentalize them, you keep them separated, you get you get the story from one. Of course, you you when you get the first one, you don't really believe it, right? And you try to corroborate it mean by 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 physical evidence or whatever. Then the second one came in, and he starts telling me the the same story. It's like this. If I, and this example I gave to the Washington people in D.C. and the uh, Attorney General, okay. uh, Janet Reno, when I send, uh, let's say we send a, a, a astronaut to the moon, and he comes back and he says, I saw extraterrestrials, they're three feet tall, they're green, and they have three fingers and big eyes. You know, one guy, you might say, he might be full of it, you know? I don't know. But then you send another astronaut six months later, and he comes back and he tells you, yeah, I saw... I saw little men, three feet tall, with three fingers, big eyes, and they're green. We start saying, hmm. But then when you get a third one, you start saying, I better start believing there are such a racial couple. <laughs> yes, and sir. And this is the kind of situation we had here. They all didn't come at once. And they, and they were all kept separate. Uh, some of them didn't even know they were here. Once you start hearing all these guys' testimony, and they're telling you pretty much, listen, you guys are involved in this, what do you do? Well, here's the thing, and you, I'm going to go back to the question very interesting that you asked me. Uh, they all say that I'm lying. Yes. They're all saying that this is not true. You notice they never say that witnesses are lying. <laughs> you know why they never accuse the witnesses of lying? Why? Because the witnesses testified against other drug groups, Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros, ah. Juan Jose Bernabe Ravine, Rubén Tunoarse, and those guys were all convicted and are doing life sentences. So for the government to say that witnesses are lying, they would have to turn the other guys loose because they know you don't believe him. Then if they're lying about this and they're lying about that, yes, they, are, they try to say that I'm lying. Yes, How am sir. I going to lie? I'm not the witness. I'm the investigator. Yes, so sir. for them to say I'm lying, it's a very weak point they're making and nobody challenges them. And if I'm lying, then how many witnesses do they have that were also at the scene of the crime that'll say that the story that these witnesses are saying is not true? They don't have one witness to say to the contrary. As a matter of fact, I had three, and about a year ago, I brought another witness, and guess what? He corroborated the other three. Wow. So it's easy to say he's lying. Yeah. Where, like, I, like, like I had to put the proof where the pudding was. I had to put the proof and the evidence before court, which I did. Right. What are they? What are they bringing as evidence that 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 this is a lie? Yeah, what, 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 what would you have to gain about, from lying? Nothing. Nothing. And brother. what would the witnesses have to gain by lying? Yeah, nothing. Nothing but problems. I mean, why would they, why would they, why would they want to make up stuff that's going to put them in great danger? Not only in danger by being killed by the cartels, but in danger from being killed by our own CIA. Right. This is the problem that people don't look at. Our situation is very, very dangerous. Why would I want to make something that will really upset my own government against me? Am I crazy? You have to be dumb and nuts. Did you start bringing this up to your supervisor? What you, what you, like when you first found out about it? Of course, they all know about it. And, and what did they tell you when you told them, hey, the CIA is in on this? They told me to shut down the investigation, shut it down. Oh, wow. It's, this, is, this is almost like a, like a spy movie, brother. And then they started investigating me. <laughs> and, and what do they find? Well, they, first of all, they try to, uh, they, they set a team of investigators 
to investigate me for kidnapping Dr. Machine, which I was ordered oh. by the Attorney General of the United States to do, along with the director of the DEA. And I thought they were kidding. They said, we're here to investigate you on the kidnapping of Dr. Machine. And I said, yes, I kidnapped him. I, I admit it. I think I did a pretty good job of kidnapping him. <laughs> I think you did too, Hector. Oh, my God. So are you now shunned in the community of the DEA or law enforcement? No, the DEA people love me. Uh, uh, how about the higher-ups? Uh, the government, uh, the higher-ups obviously don't like me, but I don't care. I'm a hero to the gunslingers, to the undercover guys, the real, the real, the real macho guys at DEA respect me and love me, and I love them. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So, so what happened? So you, you got into the case in what year, 89? 89, yes. And how long were you investigated the case? Uh, for six years after that. Oh, six years? Yes. Wow. So you really invested time into this. So when did they find, did they kick you off the case or they'd say, oh, you solved it and they just kind of looked the other way? Uh, no, they, uh, they, they, they got me off the case and they sent me to Washington. And they ordered me not to talk to the witnesses and they ordered me not to talk to any of my um, sources that I had been developing in Mexico. And you stayed quiet all those years about, the, about what happened? Or did you tell people? I had to stay quiet. They told me that if I didn't stay quiet, that I would find myself in a Mexican prison. They told me that if I upset my government, that I had to warn in Mexico and, um, um, you know, I could very well find myself in a Mexican jail. Uh, and, and that I knew that I wouldn't last a week alive in Mexico as all the drug lords hated me because I had chased them all and got in shootouts with them in Mexico. Wow. So then after... After you, you're, you're, off the, you're off the case, you're gone. Why now are you coming and speaking and saying all this truth? Because I always wanted to say it. Because Kiki Camarena was a fellow Mexican friend of mine. And I felt that they, they lied to him. I mean, they lied to his family. They lied to me. They lied to you. They lied to everybody. They inundated our country with drugs, they, every time we'd arrest CIA pilots with 20 tons of cocaine, we were ordered to release them and, 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 and give back their 20 tons of cocaine, give back their money that we seized. But when we would get a Chicanito, a little Mexican guy or a little black guy over there with three ounces of, of cocaine, they'd lock him up for 15, 20 years. Wow. And that's what I saw. And this is why I'm saying what I'm saying right now. Uh, there was a, a great betrayal, not only of Camarena, not only of me, not you two were betrayed. We were yes. all betrayed and we yes. were all lied to. Yes, sir. And that is a fact. And this is why I'm speaking out now. And I dare anybody to challenge me and prove to me that I'm a liar. So pretty much what you're saying is America was, oh, I don't know, maybe still is a major player in the drug business. The CIA has never worked under a constitutional law. The CIA has always supported their black operations with drug monies. They've done this uh, back in the 60s and 70s during the Vietnam War. They moved that same operation over to South America uh, in uh, Nicaragua uh, in the 70s and 80s. They were, they, were, they were funding an unauthorized war in Nicaragua, a war that was not authorized by US Congress with drug monies. And to fund a war, my friend, it doesn't take millions or billions. It takes trillions of dollars. Wow. And they did that. And, and they were flooding the inner cities of cocaine and then eventually turned to crack and became the epidemic that we had in the 80s, right? They created generations of crack addicts in our inner cities, not only in Los Angeles, also in the New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, all the, all the major cities, to, to basically fund a capricious drug war that was not authorized. They didn't care about our own citizens. They don't care about drugs. And the CIA is not a law enforcement agency, I repeat. They are an intelligence agency and they will do anything uh, to basically protect the, uh, the uh, secure, national security of the United States, whether they have to involve themselves in illegal activities or not. So, so you're saying to this day the CIA still deals with drugs? I don't know anymore, but I do know that they've always, since I was with DEA, they were always uh, basically involved in drugs. And like I said, in the 60s and 70s, when I first came on, 
they they were involved in uh, in uh, basically uh, in drugs in 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 funding a war in, in Cambodia, fighting the Cambodia and Laos right. and Lotion armies with drug monies, heroin monies back then, and then they shifted and started. Uh, funding the war in Nicaragua with cocaine. What? Who they're funding right now with drugs? I don't know, but I, I would suspect they're still involved in criminal activity. Now, are they also choosing like which cartel to work with, or are these guys working with everybody? How do you think that goes down? Well, back then they were working with two cartels. They were working with the Medellin cartel. They were working with Pablo Escobar, and they were also working for the Guadalajara cartel. Both the Medellin cartel and Guadalajara cartel were uh, giving the CIA money uh, to fund the war in Nicaragua. And it wasn't just the CIA, okay? It's also the NSC, uh, National Security Council, the DIA, and the CIA. Uh, they, 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 they become involved in this covert big operations. Kiki unknowingly basically uh, stumbled into a, a major gun running operation in Veracruz, in Mexico, Veracruz. They were using Caro Quitero's ranch as a, to transship weapons from there, Veracruz, to okay. Ilipango, South America, for the Contras. Kiki didn't know. All he knew, because he was told that there was a lot of cocaine being flown into Caro Quitero's ranch in Veracruz. Kiki Camarena did not know that Caro Quintero had basically rented, leased, what have you, his ranch to Oliver North and Felix Rodriguez of the CIA. They were trading contras there and they were also receiving cocaine there. So Kiki, all he knew is what that they were bringing in tons of cocaine. He didn't know what he got into. Wow. Now, what, how high do you think this corruption goes up first in the Mexican government and second in the American government? All the way to the top in both governments. All the way to the presidency. There That's... is corruption in our in our country, and uh, basically was very 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 corrupt, as we know. Uh, corruption is in all at all levels of the Mexican government. But I will say this: the U.S. can give the Mexicans lessons on corruption. Very very strong statement. It's a very, so it's a very sad picture, and I and a very very sad. To, put, to paint such a bleak and, and dark picture, but I'm sorry, I've seen it. Yeah, you, you, you see it firsthand. Well, so is Mexico. Do you, do you think Mexico now is pretty much ran by the cartels, narco-traficantes? Totally a narco state. Did, totally an article say did you see that uh, one, I'm sorry did you yes. see that that one uh, that one thing when I think they got uh, Chapo's kids? And they and they try to arrest them, and then after that they had a gunfight, and I think the governor of that state let them go. Violence paralyzed the streets of a Mexican city yesterday as security forces traded gunfire with heavily armed members of a drug cartel. The son of the notorious drug kingpin El Chapo was taken into custody, then let go. CBS News correspondent Errol Barnett explains why. It was a battle zone Thursday in the city of Culiacan, Mexico, the historic homeland to the violent Sinaloa drug cartel. Police confirmed they were patrolling a neighborhood when they were fired upon from a house. Once they fought back and entered that house, they captured and arrested Ovidio Guzman Lopez, a key figure in the cartel after his father, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, began a life sentence in the U.S. back in July. Police appeared to be outgunned by drug cartel forces as civilians ran for safety. Cartel members setting vehicles on fire to block roads, preventing security forces from maneuvering as men with heavy machine guns opened fire. I don't think we've really seen anything like this on this scale in Mexico, maybe ever. Mexico's own security forces don't have the ability to defeat a cartel with, you know, all the gun power that the Mexican military has, the Mexican police. To stem the violence, Mexican security officials were forced to release Guzman. It's just such a remarkable embarrassment for the Mexican government. You know, El Chapo's escape from prison probably would go at the top of that list, and this is probably just after that. It wasn't the governor, it was the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador himself, uh, basically ordered uh, the military, the Mexican army, to release 
El Chapo's son, because the, the Sinaloa cartel has surrounded the Mexican fort there in near Culiacán, and uh, we're going to execute all the soldiers if they did not turn the uh, the, the prisoner loose. Chap, right. el, Chap, el Chapito, not El Chapo Guzman's sons. Uh, that was a real slap in the face for the Mexican government. It showed that the, uh, the cartels are better armed and more powerful than the Mexican uh, military. Do you think America rather, because when you were working the cases, uh, a lot of the cartels were like one unit, right? It was more, more unity between the cartels. Now you got a lot of facets of cartels. Do you think the government prefers it like that or would they like it where it was one big cartel? I'm going to answer this by saying that the situation in Mexico, as far as the cartels go, has gotten worse. And it's gotten worse because in the uh, 80s, when 90s, when I was with DEA, there was only one cartel. Uh, it was the Guadalajara, Guadalajara cartel, which was run by Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, who ran it with an iron fist. There was no uh, extortion, raping, and murders of regular citizens the way it is now. Ever since we dismantled the Guadalajara cartel because of Kiki's murder, and we did, we dismantled it, uh, a lot of little groups sprang up. Right. Now all these groups are, are, are protected by different governors of different states, <laughs> and they're all warring with each other. There's no control. They go out and extort people. They rape girls out in the street. They kill whoever they want to kill and it's worse than ever. Look at the situation here in, in, in uh, November of uh, 2019, when the Sinaloa cartel executed nine members of the Mormon family that were traveling uh -huh. to uh, Sonora to a uh, wedding. This is for the record. Nita and four of my grandchildren are burnt and shot up. Right on the road out of La Mora. The reason that they did it was because the La Maron family was uh, reneging or refusing to pay them extortion monies. So to bring him in line, they attacked 13 women and children, killing nine of them. Wow. And three babies were in baby chairs, and they set him on fire. And guess what, folks? Nobody's been arrested for those murders. You're 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 absolutely right. I mean, uh, I got a, I got a question for you because you said about the extortion. With all the money these guys are making, I can't figure out why are they out there extorting people that are selling tamales, got a little tiendita. If there if there's so much money going to these cartel guys, why are they doing all that? Well, because, you know, they, they patrol with the police now. And why not? Why, if you feel like getting money from somebody, why not get it? Just power hungry. If you see a beautiful girl, why not rape her if you like her? It's going to stop you. Now, That's the way it is. If, let's say, Hector, you were in charge of trying to bring down the, the drug ring that's going on in Mexico and everything else, how do you go about trying to fight that now, as big as they've gotten? You have to start by cleansing out the government, changing the government. And you have to start by basically hiring a new police force, a new military, everything new. You have to start from ground zero again and build a society. And guess what? If we don't start taking care of our corruption problems in this country, we're going to end up like a third world country worse than Mexico. Wow. Look at what's going on in this country. We always say, look at Mexico, look at Mexico, look at our country. Look at the corruption here. We had an election. I'm not, I'm not for neither party. Do you really believe that that election was an honest election? They say, well, yeah, there was corruption, but it wasn't enough to change the vote. Jesus Christ, they were, we're admitting and saying, okay, so there's corruption, but it's not enough to change the, 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 the election. What are we talking about? The, all those people that, 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 that stole uh, votes, they should all be in jail. They should all be locked up. I well, we'll take a little bit into the small bit into the political realm because I've heard you say before, and you I completely understand because you're ex-law enforcement. You you're like a 
a, a pro build the wall guy, right? So my question to you is, if we built a wall, aren't we caging ourselves in with the real wolves? You know, a wall is going to help, but it's not going to solve anything. Right. Because they'll always find a way to bring in the drugs. Either they'll fly them over, they'll dig underneath, as we've already seen. They'll bring it in by, by, by boat. They'll bring it in by drone. They will always find a way to supply the demand for drugs. Right. Uh, how, what do you say to people that, that the argument is say, well, if America didn't have such an appetite for all these drugs, there wouldn't be no demand? That is correct. We should, we should actually try to uh, show people that drugs are bad and curb the demand. But I don't really think we, our government really wants to solve it either. It's a, it's a form of making money, illegal money. I, I'm in the same boat as you, Hector. I'm thinking, listen, if somebody told the government, hey, there's a dirty bomb coming over the border, they're going to shut that border down. They're going to make sure that dirty bomb doesn't come over. I think it kind of it looked the other way, and it, it kind of generates money. Well, that, that's the problem is that, you know, people, the smugglers are going to smuggle uh, whatever it is that's going to make him some money. They'll smuggle a terrorist. They'll smuggle a Taliban guy. They'll smuggle our enemies, anybody. They don't just smuggle illegal aliens. I wish they would just smuggle illegal aliens. They're smuggling in assassins, M13 gang members. They're smuggling in uh, anybody that will make him make any money. They'll, they'll, they'll smuggle a guy in with a goddamn nuclear bomb if they can get away. They can make money, yes, sir. What, what did you think when you heard the... And I can't remember exactly what the Mexican president said about... Que, que ahora va a abrazar no con, no con balas. He's going to fight the traffickers con abrazos y no con balas. In other words, he's going to fight them with hugs, not with bullets. What, the way I understand the story is that uh, after the uh, murder of the uh, La Baron Mormon family members, that Donald Trump offered to send SEALs and Marines to combat, to do war against the cartels. And Lopez Obrador answered him, what I'm trying to award is a war. I'm going to fight uh, the drug war on abrazos, no balazos. I'm going to fight the drug war with hugs, not bullets. What did you think when you heard that? I think it's so ridiculous. How do you fight somebody that's got a knife to your throat? without You're going to hug him when he's cutting your neck off, your gate off? Yeah, to me, it seems like that was like a declaration of uh, it's your guys' country to the cartel. It's a declaration of surrender to the cartels, yes. Yes, right? Wow. So nowadays, a lot of times, the narcos are they're glorified. They're, they're, they're shown to be almost like, like Jesse James, Billy the Kid. They're, they're, they've been made folk heroes, it seems like, especially like uh, in, in, you know, in, in shows and in music. What do you personally feel these guys are or were? Well, they are glorified as big macho, heroes, which are not, I can tell you because I've done a war with them, the, big, the, big, the main guys always run. Look at when uh, they were trying to arrest El Chapo when he ran like a little rat through the damn tunnel there. If he would have had the, the, the courage and been the brave guy that they made, made a corrido of him to be, he would have stayed there and fought with his men. Okay? You, you don't run like a little rat through a tunnel, and then they make a corrido and make you a famous guy. See, they're not real for what they really are. One-on-one, -on -one, these guys are nobodies. They would be no match to our SEALs and Marines, no match. If we send our people in there, we'd clean them out in two weeks. So after, after the case is over with, is there any Americans that have been charged or even been investigated for the Kiki Camarena murder? No, they're not. And why not? They're not interested. They're just looking the other way? They don't care. Maybe what? Camarena, I don't know. I, I, I just, there's no interest in solving Camarena's murder and arresting anybody on, on, on this kind of... As a matter of fact, they're, they're turning loose a lot of the people that were arrested for Kiki's murder. Yeah, yeah I saw... Uh, what's the name got released? Um, uh, Quintero. Uh, and, 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 and Caro Quintero, too, got, you know... They're, was they're it, all free. Wasn't Caro Quintero released like on a technicality or something? No, there was no technicality. It released a, 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 on a false legal technicality. They said that he should have not been tried in federal court. They should have been tried in state court. Just an excuse to let him go. That's all. Right. So now that you've worked the, the drug scene for so many years, I'd like to know what your take is on marijuana. 
Because marijuana has really changed from the time you were busting people to today's day and age. So as a, as a former uh, DEA agent, what's your take on marijuana? Well, I think marijuana should be legalized. Uh, I, I, more and more, they're finding a lot of, uh, you know, uh, medical remedies uh, that the drug has. I don't, it's not seen as a dangerous drug, and I don't particularly uh, have anything against the legal addiction of marijuana. And did you bust a lot of people for marijuana back in the days? I busted and, and even got involved in shootouts with people over marijuana. And and now after so many years, you you kind of change uh change your look out your outlook on it, or back then you you also thought the same way about it. Well, you know when you're a law enforcement officer, you enforce the laws. Back then it was against the law, and I enforced the law. Now it's not against the law. So if people, I go with society. Okay. If if society says that they want to make it legal, then then I'm not I'm not going to go against my 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 peers uh, society. If you had it your way, who would you see come to justice as far as Americans go for the Kiki Camarena case? I would like to see um, some people in our government uh, arrested. I would like to see a, a corrupt DEA agent that betrayed Kiki Camarena, that turned him in, who um, everybody's made a national hero over here. I'd like to see uh, the CIA uh, operative that interrogated Kiki also arrested. And uh, even I'd like to see further up, people further up in the chain that were in the uh, Bush administration be arrested. Now, when the people who want to see your docuseries, where can they see it? Uh, they can see it on uh, Prime Video on, on, on Amazon. Do you also got a YouTube thing going on right now with that? Uh, yes. Uh, and also, I have a book. It's called The Last Narc. They can buy it on Amazon. It's, it's a lot more detail about how the CIA works, how the DEA works in foreign countries. Uh, it, 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 it's also, uh, it also uh, basically in, in my book, we, uh, we uh, show a lot of other cases that I worked or detail a lot of other cases that I worked. There were major cases going undercover into corrupt, uh, basically sure as people here in this country uh, are going undercover into serial killers. It's a very interesting book. I really recommend it. You, you know who I forgot to ask you about? Um, Juan Jose Esperraga, Azul. Yes. Do you believe he's dead? I believe he is because one of the sicarios, one of the witnesses that you saw on the last night, yes. is personal compadres with El Azul. And he tells me that the family has assured him that he's dead. As a matter of fact, El Azul baptized one of my sicarios, uh, or witnesses, uh, daughters. Okay, okay. Well, I just want to tell you, from me, Hector, you are a real American hero, brother. You, you, you've pretty much put your whole career on the line. Just like Kiki Camarena, the difference is Kiki Camarena lost his life and he was betrayed by his government, man. And I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for sharing your story, brother. And I want to give you the last word. I want to tell the people in this country, don't trust your governments. Don't do drugs because you think you're going to be, you're getting away with something. You're not getting away with anything. You're only hurting yourself. Drugs are destructive. They destroy families. Our government doesn't care. Our government will even secretly provide you with the drugs. Mm -hmm. And then once you start selling them, they'll even arrest you for selling the drugs that they gave you. Don't be tricked by these people. You family members, tell your children if you're home, at home, tell them, how destructive this, this the, 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 the drug situation is, drug abuse is, not to get involved, not to ruin their lives, not to throw away their lives over a, a, a stupid drug. Mm. 